today I'm preaching on the topic of modest apparel. Modest apparel. Um, so modest clothing. And um, just preaching on this, just going on from the virtuous woman, been thinking about it. And also a lot of you have asked me about it. And it's one of those things because clothing is... Um, it's very outward, isn't it? So it's something that everyone can see. It's some, something that's a hot topic of discussion. But, um, and it's not something that we are given a lot of direction. Well, we're not given a lot. Not, I wouldn't say direction. We're not given a lot of specifics in the Bible. So people have a lot of questions about, well, you know, if the Bible says to, to wear modest apparel, um, how, do I, how do I figure out what modest apparel is? Does it, is you know, you know what, what is the answer? How do I know whether I'm dressed in a way that's pleasing to the Lord? Now, I don't think I can give you, you know, the 100% right answer because I don't think there is a silver bullet, but I think there are principles that we can follow in the Bible to help us figure out, you know, are we dressed in a way that's pleasing to God or not? Um, and that's what I'm going to give you today. So I'm going to talk a bit about modest apparel, um, and I've sort of summed it up into four factors that um, will sway, may sway your decision on what is modest apparel. But let's look. Let's go first of all to the to the um, to the passages. So the first one is in First Timothy two, starting at verse nine. It says, "In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel." with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Um, so that's one of them. And the other we'll just go to, which is uh, sort of like the parallel passage to uh, this little bit here. And I'll show you that they have some similarities. Um, but in 1 Peter 3, we'll read just uh, the first four verses. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God, of great price. Now, I don't think what these passages are teaching, and somebody actually asked me this recently, asking, you know, do, you, do I think that the Bible forbids wearing jewellery, you know, doing up your hair, wearing makeup? I, I don't believe that's what these passages are teaching. I don't think it's a sin to do the things that are mentioned in these passages. What I believe what these passages are teaching is what ought to make a woman beautiful. You know, when it talks about the adorning, um, uh, First Peter 2, 9, so it says here, in like manner also that women adorn themselves. So what is it to adorn yourself? It's like to, to make yourself beautiful, isn't it? It's like when a bride adorns herself on a wedding day for her husband. Um, it's to make yourself beautiful. So what these passages are talking about is what should make a Christian woman beautiful is her godliness and not her outward appearance. But it's not teaching that the things that are mentioned here are sinful in and of themselves, but it's a, it's a lifestyle that should characterize you. It's not your outward appearance, it's your godliness. And I think, you know, we saw in 1 Peter 3 where it talks about the conversation, the chaste conversation, which is not how a woman talks, it's, it's her lifestyle, right, in the Bible. Conversation is your, your lifestyle and how you live. But even the context of 1 Timothy 2 is talking about our life as well in the sense that it's asking you know, men everywhere to pray um, and it says here for kings and for all that are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. So I think that is the context there, that that is what should characterize our life, right? It's not that you're, you're, you're praying all the time everywhere, that's all they see. It's just it's characterized by, you know, we are people of prayer. You know, the church is a house of prayer. Um, and that's something that should characterize our life. Just like a woman, what should characterize her is her godliness, and well, that's what makes her beautiful, not the outward ador adorning. So your appearance should not be the defining factor of your beauty. And if people think you're pretty, but place no value on your character, like, you know, you know somebody might think, oh, you know, you, know you, you might talk about other people and say, oh, that lady is really pretty, she's really beautiful, but oh, she's really hard to deal with. And, you know, they might say, call them names and whatnot. Like, that's not what you want people to think about you as a Christian person or a Christian 
woman. It's like, you know, you're, you're, you look really smick on the outside, but you know, you, you, nobody, everyone thinks you're a terrible person and you're, you know, you're not somebody that's trustworthy, you're not somebody that's faithful, you're not somebody that has virtue, um, you, know, you don't have high morals and things like that. That's, that's not the goal, just to be pretty, but you know, have no character. It's, it's, it's the opposite, you know, to have character and godliness and beauty is secondary. Um, so before I go into just the three types of modest apparel, Im immodest apparel, that I believe that these passages allude to. And that's what I'm going through today, like three types of immodest apparel, and then four factors to help you decide um, on, your, on your apparel. It's just to address the issue of, of men, and, men and modest apparel, right? Men and immodest apparel. Because one thing you'll notice here in these passages is that it's directed at females. It's not directed at males. Why? Because it's a feminine attribute to be overly concerned with your outward appearance. It's not, a, it's not a masculine attribute. That's why this is directed at women. It's not directed at men. Um, but the same principle applies to men. Obviously, if women should not be focused on the outward appearance and they should be focusing on the inward man, the same goes for men, right? Like a man should be focused on the, on the inward and not on the outward. But in addition to that, because it's something that's a feminine attribute, if a man is overly concerned about his outward appearance, he needs to stop being so effeminate. You know, he needs to stop having that feminine attribute um, as well as, you know, working on the inward. Whereas, uh, you know, for a woman, it's, it's normal to, you know, want to uh, beautify yourself, but what should characterize you and you should focus more time on is the inward beauty rather than the outward beauty. So, you know, this is, what, this is why I, love, I like uniforms, because you don't have to, like, make the decisions about clothing, right? Like, if you have a uniform, you just get up and wear the same thing every day. And, and even, like, my work doesn't have a uniform. You know, it's corporate at work. But Elizabeth knows me. It's, I, I just get, you know, I've got two blue shirts and just, you know, rotate them now and then. You know, you've got a couple of jumpers, you get your, your work shoes, and you can wear the same thing. And you just, want, you just want to be dressed in a way where, you know, people just realize that you just fit in. And it's not, like, something that you... People will notice you about, you're just dressed and you, you go to work and you don't have to really think about it. That's what I think uh, men should be like. Uh, you know, you, you, you just make sure you're clean cut uh, and things like that. So it goes for other areas of appearance, right? You know, there's a difference between staying in shape and being, you know, being healthy. Uh, and there's another difference between over obsessing over your body and, you know, you, know, you, you see it on YouTube and whatnot. There's those guys that are so big, it just turns into an obsession for them and they really want to show off the work that they've put into their body. So there's a difference between just being healthy, strengthening your arms and doing it to, to be able to show off that body or, you know, wanting to be clean cut as opposed to like having a haircut that you, you know, you always have to fix, you have to put a lot of product in there, you're always, you know, every time you go to the toilet, you're checking yourself out to make sure that it's still in place. Uh, you know, being presentable versus, you know, just obsessing over your outfits, you know, having different, so many different outfits, more outfits that you can even wear. It's the same with shoes. It's like, you know, you just have appropriate shoes for the task. You know, like for me, you know, you've got, you got your sports shoes, you've got your work shoes, you've got your, your, uh, your running, your, your walking shoes. You've just got shoes that are practical as opposed to shoes that you need to match all your outfits and everything like that. I really personally think that men that are obsessed with shoes is, are really girly. They're really feminine. And I, that's my opinion. You know, my opinion is if, if men are obsessed with shoes. Because if men are obsessed with clothes, you know, and they need to, like, have collections of clothes and things like that, I, that's, that's, a, that's a female attribute. You know, this is why this is, this is directed at women, that women don't adorn themselves with all these clothes and gold and pearls and costly array because it's something that, is for, that females worry about, not, not men. So, you know, I know people, you know, they have, they have all these different types of fancy shoes and, and it's not even uh, just shoes like casual shoes. It comes to like sports shoes as well. I know people that are basketballers and they need to get the latest Air Jordans and, you know, they'll line up and wait for them. They, they collect all these different shoes and they might wear them only once or twice. Um, it's the same with soccer shoes, right? Like some soccer players, you know, they need every season, they need to get the latest thing that's out there. Um, they really care like what they look like. Um, you know, they want, want to stand out on the pitch. Uh, to me, that's, that's, a, that's a feminine attribute. So 
just wanted to, to make that note as we go into immodest clothing that, you know, where do men fit into the equation? Obviously, these principles apply to men, but shouldn't uh, so because it's a little, it's, it's effeminate for men to be overly concerned about uh, looking beautiful, right, on the outward. So there's three types of immodest apparel that I believe that these passages um, allude to. And we'll go, th go through the, the three different types. The first one is clothes or the lack thereof of clothes. And it's clothes that draw attention to your body, right? Clothes that draw attention to your body. Um, you, know, you know, either make your curves look bigger or, you know, make people look at certain places. You know, there, there are dresses out there that have, uh, you know, windows in them that are like right here for ladies. Now, if there's a window in a dress that is right here, I mean, what do you think that dress is designed to do? Like, well, that dress is obviously designed to draw attention to a woman's breasts, right? As opposed to, you know, it not drawing attention to her body. Because what is mod modesty is when you don't want to draw attention to yourself, right? Immodesty is when you draw attention to yourself. And if we are to strive for modest apparel, we want clothes where it draws the least amount of attention to us um, in certain situations. So clothes, or the lack thereof, because it might be a fact that you're not wearing enough clothes, you know, and that's drawing attention to yourself or to, to your body, or the way the clothing is designed. Now you'll see here that it says in 1 Timothy uh, 2 verse 9, it says that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness. Now, what is shamefacedness? Shamefacedness is when you're bashful, right? It's like you have shame. You don't want people to necessarily look at your body. If you think of somebody that's shameful, it's like they're covering up. They don't want people to look at them as opposed to a woman that is trying to cover her nakedness, but not really trying to cover her nakedness in a sense that, yeah, she's got clothes on, but, you know, it's, it's you know, you, you could basically see her, her nakedness and the figure of her body. So a woman ought to feel ashamed when showing her nakedness or nearly showing it. Um, it's this shamefacedness. Shame and, you know, it goes the same for, you know, the pictures that you put of yourself out there on Facebook and social media, you know, photos that you share of yourself. Are you, do you have shamefacedness when you share those photos, you know, there are, there are ladies that share photos and, you know, you look at it, it accentuates certain body parts. It makes people draw their eyes to their body. This is not what a Christian woman ought to be doing. You shouldn't be uh, putting these sort of photos out there. Um, now, it's not a sin for a woman to wear pants, and, and I'm not going into that uh, today. But that is one reason why that a lot of Christian women are for skirts rather than pants because skirts obviously cover up curves more. It's a, it's a more modest garment than pants are. And that's why a lot of women prefer skirts over pants. A lot of Christian women prefer skirts over pants because um, it's a lot more modest because it covers a lot more. But, you know, I'm not saying that it's a sin to wear pants. I'm not saying that if you wear pants, you know, you're, you're not being modest. I'm just saying these are, these are some of my opinions and some of the things that you want to think about uh, when we are thinking about immodest apparel. Um, now, what is it in uh, second, uh, 1 Peter 3? Uh, let's go there. 1 Peter 3, what's the parallels? So we've got the shamefacedness, but what do we see in 1 Peter 3? While they behaved, behold your chaste conversation. Right? Coupled with fear. So what is the parallel in 1 Peter 3? It's about chastity. If you think about shamefacedness, right? You don't want people to look at your nakedness. You don't necessarily want people to, to draw attention to your body. In 1 Peter 3, it's talking about being chaste. What is chaste? What is chastity? It's when you're pure. You know, it's when you're, when you're a virgin. So when people look at your lifestyle, is it a lifestyle that is characterized by chastity and purity and virginity? You know, you may be a virgin, meaning like you, you have not fornicated with anybody, but do you dress like a virgin? You know, these are the sort of questions women need to ask themselves. I'm a virgin, but when somebody looks at me, do they think I'm a virgin? Or do I dress like a prostitute? Do I dress like somebody that does, it has no shamefacedness? Um, you know, if you're married, do you dress as though you are? Because remember the vow you made when you were married that you would keep yourself only for one person. 
So why are you bearing the nakedness, the body that now belongs to somebody else, to the world? You know, so if you're married, do you dress as though you're married? You know, you're committed to one man, but do you dress as though you are only for one man? Or do you dress in a way that your body is for everybody to enjoy because everybody can see it the way you're dressed? Um, you know, you want to have some, you want to have some respect for your purity. That's what we've lost today, and especially amongst the young people, to the point where, you know, young people these days, they wear things that they, they even know that they're showing off their body and whatnot, but everybody's doing it, that it's not a big deal anymore because purity and shamefacedness are not valued anymore in this society. And in, amongst God's people, they still should be valued. Uh, purity has value. And even though the world is trying to get rid of purity and, and negate it, that's because, you know, even the world, if you think about it, values purity. They, why? Because if you think about the, the ungodly guys that want to chase after girls, they, they, they would rather have a, a virgin, wouldn't they? They're always going after the virgins. The girls that are pure are more desirable for them than girls that are prostitutes, that are whores, and they're just sleeping around with everybody because they even recognize that there is value in somebody that is not defiled yet, that is pure. Um, and, you know, God also values purity. And that's why when he says here um that the lady who has a meek and quiet spirit and, and it's the hidden man of the heart look at this which is in the sight of god of great price so you know according to god purity is of high value but why as christians as as when as as young women do you not value your own purity in the sense that you have respect for it and you have that shamefacedness and that chase conversation remember the bible says you know favor uh, uh favor is uh, uh favor is the deceitful and beauty is vain but a woman that feareth the lord she shall be praised all right now uh what's the opposite what's the opposite of chase and uh oh what's that word i lost it now shamefacedness chase and shamefacedness what's the opposite Proverbs 7, verse 10, And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. She is loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. So not only is this woman dressed immodestly, and it, it, it describes her as having the clothing of a prostitute. It's like you look at her, she's dressed like the prostitute's dress. And a lot of young ladies these days, they dress like prostitutes. They dress like people that, you know, if you were to go, I don't know, over here, like King's Cross or whatever, and the women are trying to advertise their body to get people to sleep with them for money, that's how a lot of young people just dress like every day these days. They, that's just how they dress. This is not how Christian women ought to dress, having clothes and making themselves look like a prostitute. Um, she is loud and stubborn, so that's the difference between meek and quiet, right? So whereas the Christian woman should be um, characterized by having a meek and quiet spirit, the, 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 the strange woman here who has the attire of a harlot, she is loud and stubborn and is not a keeper of them. Her feet abide not in her house. So this is a, another aspect, obviously, of modesty to consider, which is you know, how you talk you know, and how you communicate. Um, is that also um, characterized by modesty? So that's the first one, clothes that are, are draw attention to your body. Uh, what's number two? Let's go back to 1 Timothy 2 verse 9. Number two is clothes that draw attention to themselves. So if you're actually wearing clothes that are so loud and out there that people you know, uh, notice are drawing attention to the clothes themselves. So they may not be drawing attention to your body, but the clothes themselves are drawing attention. So, you know, the Bible says here, shamefacedness and sobriety. So what is sobriety is when, you know, you're sober, you're serious, you've considered how you're dressed, right? You're seriously thinking about, you know, what God wants from you, what God, uh, you know, would how he would like you to dress, and you're serious and mature about it. So, you know, you don't want to be dressed like a slob. You don't want to be dressed like the, the, you know, the young men these days with their pants like to their knees, showing their boxes and, um, you know, the things that they do. I mean, do you look at those sort of people and think, did they seriously think about how they are dressed? But as Christians, we ought to think about that too. Are we dressed like slobs? Do we, do, have we thought about, you know, how we look 
um, when we go out. Um, so, you know, for, even for men and women, you know, you, you shouldn't dress and look like, you know, like a cartoon character. You know, I know in the Asian culture, a lot of people do that where they have, you know, these fancy hairdos, they color their hair pink and purple and, and all these sorts of uh, different colors. Uh, I personally don't think that is how uh, a Christian should be characterized and how, how we should look. Um, and it goes the same for your children as well. I mean, a lot of, uh, a lot of parents, they, they, you know, they, they do things to their children that they would not necessarily want done to themselves um, and, and you know, give them embarrassing haircuts and things like that. So just think about these things. You know, you're sober in, in making these decisions. Um, you know, in 1 Peter 3, uh, it says that, uh, you know, that it was... Uh, um, let's go back there. Show you 1 Peter 3. In verse 3, it talks about here the chase conversation and it's coupled with fear. A fear of what? A fear of God, right? When we're sober and we think about how we dress, are we, do we have a fear of God where we're considering God in our decisions, in how we dress? And again, when it says here, you know, the woman is characterized by a meek and quiet spirit, when we think this should be our character, should we be wearing these, you know, what people would call loud outfits? You know, should our clothing be loud when, as a woman, you should be characterized by being meek and quiet? So, number one, what was that? Draw, clothes that draw attention to your body. Number two is clothes that draw attention to themselves. And the third type of immodest clothing is clothes that draw attention to your wealth. So, we see the shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold, or pearls, or costly array. So gold and pearls sort of goes without saying, right? Um, but what about the broided hair? You know, it requires, sometimes it requires a lot of time and money for, for women to, to do up their hair. I, I was shocked when I found out how much people actually spend, uh, how much ladies spend straightening and curling and coloring their hair. Uh, and maybe, you know, Kayla obviously would have some insight into that because she was doing hair and how much women would spend and the, the time that they would spend as well and, and the amount of uh, trips that they would go, uh, you know, back and forth to, to, to keep their hair the way they would like it, which is just, you know, obviously different to how they were born with. But, you know, I even had a, a friend at work recently that told me about her hair straightening experience because I, I saw her at work once and her hair was straightened, but I knew she had like really, really curly hair. And then a couple of days later, it was back to being curly again. And I said, well, what happened to your hair? Because wasn't it just straight a couple of days ago? And she was like, oh yeah, because I washed it, All right? So it seems like when you get those straightening treatments, they only last, I guess, until you wash out the product and the chemicals and then your hair goes back to how it was. So if that's only a couple of days, I mean, girls that have to have curly hair, they have to constantly straighten them. I don't know how much money and time they are spending on their hair, but, um, you know, this is, this is one of the ways uh, women can, can waste a lot of money and just spending all this money changing their hair. If your hair is straight, then you curl it. If it's curled, you straighten it. And, and the back and forth. Uh... The other thing here is uh, obviously the costly array, you know, the clothes that have the brand names, the expensive things and things like spending, you know, hundreds of dollars on, on clothing that uh, has no, you know, it doesn't add any practical value. You're just buying it for the brand. And when I think about that, I think of ladies that buy uh, really expensive handbags just because they just have that brand name, whether it's the LV or the Gucci or uh, whatever the brand name is. I mean, to me, a bag is a bag, you know, a bag from Kmart does the same job than a bag from LV. I mean, do you really need to spend that amount of money? You know, I bought a, um, a bag once um, from Crumpler and I, I, and I bought that because they actually gave like a lifetime warranty if you, you know, put any holes in it, then they would repair it for you. But what I found is, you know, and, and, and that was a backpack. So a backpack, you know, usually you're throwing around, you're traveling with it and things like that. So I wanted something that was a bit more durable. But I find that even if I, when I use a cheap backpack, because I got a cheap backpack from work, I mean, it kind of does the same thing. Like it, it, it didn't make any difference. And, and, and if you treat your bag just normally, it doesn't really put that many, that many holes in it. So, you know, was that worth it? I don't know. But, um, you know, I definitely wouldn't be spending hundreds and hundreds of dollars. I mean, I think that backpack cost me like maybe a hundred bucks. 
But these LV handbags, you ladies probably know, I mean, some of them are like thousands of dollars, $1,500 just to get a, an LV handbag. Um, and they don't really do anything much different. Um, it's just all marketing. You know, they've just marketed it to you so, wait, so that you value it. And, um, you know, you think it has that value. It's kind of like engagement rings. You know, like I, I am not for engagement rings. You know, my personal opinion is engagement rings are a waste of money. Why? Because diamonds are a waste of money. You know, like the, the good thing about an engagement ring is the gold on it, but usually an engagement ring costs a lot of money because of the diamond. But if you just, just type in Google the truth about diamonds, you'll find out that it's just like, it's a market that's just controlled. It's just really good advertising. It's just good marketing campaigns to make women believe that diamonds are of value. But diamonds, they, they, don't have any, they don't have any value. They only have artificial value because people want them, but they don't have any inherent value. And people find that out when they try and sell their engagement ring. They try and sell it. There's, nobody wants to buy it because you know, that's why they had to have the marketing campaign that diamonds are forever so that you won't try and sell it and find that out. You, know, you keep it as an heirloom and pass it down and things like that. And you'll spend all that money on it. So it's the same thing with uh, a lot of this costly array. It's just marketing. It's not actually adding any, any value. Now, I won't go too much further into this point, but I, I want to show you this verse because it's, I find it's a really interesting verse uh, in Philippians 4, 5. It says, let your moderation... So it's to, this is talking about some principles and, and, and character that a Christian should have. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. And what I find so interesting about this verse is that when you think of modesty and, and doing things moderately, it's so that you're not noticed. But to the Christian, the Bible is saying here that your moderation is what should be known unto all men. So isn't that interesting that, you know, whilst you strive to be somebody that is modest, yet that is what you should be known for, your modesty. Yes, yeah? so I, I just think it's a great verse there that, that that is what should be known unto all men, is how moderate you are, not how extravagant you are. And obviously the context there is that the Lord is at hand because you may strive for all these riches and amass all this wealth, but what are you doing with it? What are you doing for the kingdom of God with your resources? Because one day God is going to come back. And that's why there's this theme throughout the Bible of, you know, why, how, how, what sort of person should you be if one day it's all going to be burnt up, like it says in 1 Peter. You know, 1 Peter 2 says, you know, one day God's going to come back and, you know, the end is near. But even if you think about the parable of the rich fool, remember how he said, oh, he had all this wealth. He says, what should I do? Oh, I'm going to build, break my barns down and build greater, you know, and fill all that. And then I'll be able to rest and say to my soul, you know, take thy knees, eat, drink, and be merry. But what does that parable say? It says, thou fool, for tonight thy soul shall be required of thee. Because the Lord is at hand. Why are we spending so much effort amassing wealth as an end goal? You know, I understand that money is not evil. It's the love of money is the root of all evil. But you've got to ask yourself, why are you striving for all these riches? Is it just to, to make sure that your needs are met um, or you can do more things for the Lord? Or are you just doing it so that you can enjoy more costly things, costly array, girl, uh, gold, uh, pearls, um, and you know, spend more time doing your hair or you know, buying the latest shoes and whatnot? How are you using your resources for the Lord? So there's the, the three different uh, types of immodest clothing. You've got uh, clothes that draw attention to um, your body, clothes that draw attention to themselves, clothes that draw attention to your wealth. Now, because the Bible doesn't give us these specifics, how do we determine, how do we judge uh, modest clothing? Because clothing is, is like a doubtful disputation, right? In the sense that, you know, different people have different preferences and different standards. And that's what we learn in Romans 14. What we learn in Romans 14 is that conscience can be a judge after we've applied biblical principles. Our conscience says, decides, are we following those biblical principles or not? And, and Paul says, you know, why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? Meaning that if our conscience dictates that what, what we esteem to be wrong is wrong, we can't you know, necessarily impose that as a commandment on somebody else. So it's up to their conscience to decide, are they keeping these biblical principles that God has given us to live our life by? So how do we then determine the level of modesty to adhere to? Well, because the Bible doesn't give us specifics, we judge by the conscience 
response to biblical principles. So what are some biblical principles that we can look at to judge modesty when we, when we think about uh, modest clothing? Well, I've summed it up in four, and I'll try and go through them as quickly as I can. Four factors that may sway your conscience. So I can't necessarily say to you that wearing this piece of garment or wearing this piece of clothing is sinful, right? But what I can do is show you the biblical principles and then your own conscience can then use those principles to judge. And if your conscience, according to your own conscience, you esteem it to be unclean, like the Bible says in Romans 14, then to you it is unclean. I'll show you that um, just quickly. Um, 14, 14. It says here, I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. And obviously the context in Romans 14, I just want to show you this because he's not just, Paul is not saying that there's nothing sinful, right? That there's nothing unclean. Um, it's talking about doubtful disputations. So him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputation. So a doubtful disputation is something that is not clear cut in the Bible and people have different opinions on it and they have different standards based on the different principles. So what is he saying in uh, verse 14 here? I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean in and of itself, unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. So whilst I can't say to you, God says that this piece of clothing is unclean, if I give you the principles and teach you those principles, your conscience with the Holy Spirit living inside of you will be the judge of, are you keeping this principle? Are you striving to keep this principle or are you not? And therefore, you know, if it's unclean to you, it is unclean. And we also see uh, passages like this in James. I'll just go there quickly, James 4.17. It says, therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. See, so if you see the biblical principles and you say, well, that article of clothing would make me immodest and you know that that's not the good thing to do and yet you do it anyway, then you are sinning. See, so I can't say to you that, hey, I can say to you, this is my opinion, this piece of clothing draws attention to your body. And if you look at it and think, yes, it does draw attention to my body, but I'm going to wear it anyway, that's when you're in sin, right? So that's how you sort of judge these things. So what are some principles? Let's go over some a bit quickly. First one I'm going to uh, talk about is authority. Authority. Now this one is kind of clear cut, but the person in authority has to decide, right? So for the person who is under authority, these ones are clear cut. What do I mean by authority? I mean, are you even permitted by the authority in your life to wear what you want to wear? So number one here is in Ephesians 6, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with thee and thou mayest live long on the earth. Now, I personally believe that, that a daughter is always under the authority of, a woman is always under the authority of somebody, whether it's their um, father uh, or their husband when they get married. Only if their father dies or their husband dies um, like a, a married woman is like a widow. But I do think as well in the Bible, we see this principle that if the father dies, they are also no longer under an authority. So it's like if the authority in your life passes away, now that woman is no longer under authority, but otherwise she always is, either it's her father or her husband. Now this is saying children obey your parents in the Lord. So I think there is a point, I don't know what the, what the age is, but there is a point where a a, 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 a a man, I guess a, a male, right, goes from being a child to a man. Now, I guess in our day and age, you know, you, you have this, this, uh, this lifestyle where, you know, young men, they leave the home and then they live by themselves and they're single just for years and years and years and then they get married. But that's not the pattern we see in the Bible, right? The example we see in the Bible that a man leaves his father and mother and cleaves to his wife. Uh, and that's why you shouldn't really have this really long period in your life where you are a man and yet you're, you're single. Um, generally, the way the, the Bible talks about marriage and when you should get married, you know, you're young when you get married, you're young when you have children. So once you leave father and mother and you join to your wife, that's when you become a man. You're no longer a child under the authority of your parents. So I, I personally believe that, you know, uh, men that still live in their, in their parents' house you know, um, they, they are still under the authority of their parents. But, 
you know, I think there comes a time, I'm not sure what the age is if you're not married, because obviously Jesus was not under the authority of his parents, um, even though he was not married. So I haven't quite figured that one out yet. If somebody has any thoughts there, they can share it with me. So there's uh, children obeying their parents. So that means if you're a child, if you're under the authority of your parents, even if you don't think it's immodest, you know, you're wearing something, you think it's fine, you think it's immodest, but your dad or your mom says you're not wearing that. If you wear that, you're in sin, right, for the younger people. Uh, Ephesians 5, verse 22, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So now this includes what you wear. So for wives, if you were to wear something and your husband says you're not wearing that and you wear it anyway, you're in sin. Even if your husband doesn't know that you went and wore it, right? Like if he says, I don't like you dressed that way, I don't want you to wear that, but then you wear it when he's maybe away on a work trip or he doesn't notice that you, know, you sneak out and then wear it, you're still in sin. You're in sin because you're disobeying the authority in your life. And ultimately, you want to obey God. It's God the one that is telling you to obey your parents. God is the one that's telling a wife to obey her husband. So ultimately, you're sinning against God because God is the one that put these authorities in the societal structure. So number one is authority. Number two is the situation. So number one is the authority in your life. Number two is the situation. Now, although the Bible says that we should be modest, um, Modest apparel doesn't mean there are not situations where, quote-unquote, immodesty is out of character. In the sense that, you know, remember when we talked about modesty? Modesty is when you draw attention to yourself, right? It's kind of out of, it's in the wrong place and it's in the wrong situation. But that doesn't mean there are certain things that in a different situation would not be immodest. So even when you think about moderation, right? Like moderation does not mean that you're just coasting at 50%, 100% of the time. You know, if you're characterized by moderation, there, are, there may be times of extravagance. There may be times, you know, like even Paul said, that, you know, he knew how to abase and he knew how to abound. There were times where he had more or less than others, but generally, you know, that th he was living moderately. So, you know, there might be ups and downs, but then, you know, people would know you generally as your moderation would be known unto all men. So modest apparel doesn't mean there are not situations where fancy hair, clothes, jewelry are not suitable. But in these, I think in these specific situations, um, they're not immodest because they're expected, right? They're, they're, you're not necessarily drawing additional attention to yourself because in these situations, um, they're expected. I just wanted to share this one verse with you. It's not really uh, so related, but I want to show you, um, uh, sorry, it's not necessarily the same context, but I believe it is uh, related. And this is in 1 Corinthians 9.19 where Paul is talking about you know, becoming all things to all men in, t in the sense that there is a certain situation to be different um, and things like that. So this is a, this is a passage that we're, we're all quite familiar with, but I'll just I'll read a bit on. It says, Unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And now it's not without the law to Christ, um, he talks about in there. Um, but a lot of people sort of refer to this verse when they think about global missions, right? Like maybe you go to a country like Japan, right? And the missionaries in Japan, I mean, they're wearing an outfit that if you were to wear that here, you'd just be like, man, that's, that's, that's a bit loud. That's drawing to you know being in the clogs and being in that the the, the, the ceremonial gear. I mean, I, you know the things that the Japanese people wear. So they over there that might be normal. You know, like it's like if you did it, if you weren't wearing that. And I'm not an expert on Japanese culture, so if I'm wrong on this, just but I, I'm just thinking about some of the things that I've seen Japanese missionaries wear. Um, you know, over there it's like normal. It's like if, maybe if they didn't wear that, that would have been disrespectful. But if they wore that sort of garment here, you'd be like, are you going to a fancy dress party? You know, are you, are you wearing that just to you know, be different? So you see how something that might necessarily be, that might be immodest in this culture,
might not be immodest in another culture or in another situation. So you can see the situation can change the standard of immodesty, and this is something that just needs to be considered. So um, what about like situation where immodest clothes could be modest? Um, I'll, I'll just show you a couple of uh, verses quickly from the scriptures. Exodus 28. And I already sort of mentioned one of them. One of them is, you know, in the tabernacle, I don't even remember when uh, God made the, the garments for the, high, for the priests. It says here, And thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother, for glory and for beauty. So you see that there was a place where the garments were actually made in order to be beautiful because it was a picture of, you know, Jesus Christ and the temple in heaven and things like that. So in that situation, that was suitable. So it, was modest. it wasn't immodest because it was suitable for that occasion and for that situation. Uh, another is here. I'll go to Ezekiel because I, I always go to the other one. Ezekiel 10. It's just this idea, if you remember in Revelation, a bride adorned for her husband. Look here. This is when God is using this analogy with Israel, right? And, you know, tr saying that you, you, you were this uh, virgin that he found, um, you know, and then he married her, cleaned her up and sort of married her and... And whatnot. He says here, I clothed thee also with broidered work, and shod thee with badger skin, and I girded thee about with fine linen, and I covered thee with silk. So this is this is quite expensive clothes, right? I decked thee also with ornaments, and I put bracelets upon thy hands and a chain on thy neck, and I put a jewel on thy forehead, and earrings in thine ears, and a beautiful crown upon thy head. Thou was thus wast thou decked with gold and silver, and thy raiment was of fine linen and silk and broidered work. Thou didst eat fine, fine flour and honey and oil, and thou was exceeding beautiful, and thou didst prosper into a kingdom. So he, this analogy, obviously, of God beautifying you know, his bride, um, like uh, Jesus Christ, you know, he, he cleanses and washes the, the church with the washing um, of the word. So what are some other possible, possible scenarios? If we think about the three different types of immodest clothes, um, drawing attention to your body, drawing attention to your the clothes themselves drawing attention to your wealth um, we can even apply this idea of situation and show that even in these three situations these three types of immodest clothing there are situations where they may not necessarily be immodest um, and and these are these are my opinions right but one of them is let's say clothes that draw attention to your body you may wear things out and about and, and you know you know that that's why you're wearing it but think about like uh, competitive sports players you know, whether it's a, a, a lady that's a gymnast or a swimmer or a cyclist, I mean, she's not necessarily wearing that garment to draw attention to her body, but they need to wear that to give them the competitive edge. Because obviously, if you're a professional cyclist, that's what you do for a living, you're a swimmer or a gymnast, I mean, you can't be wearing like baggy skirt and then dive into the pool and, and you know, and swim like 100 meters faster than the other ladies. So. I believe in that situation that that is not being immodest because that's, you know, that's what you need to wear in terms of being competitive. So I think there, there might be situations like that where the clothes do draw attention to your body, but it's not necessarily being immodest. Um, even loud clothes and fancy clothes, you know, you might be going, like I said, to a fancy dress party. And if you are, I don't think that's being immodest because that, for that occasion and for that situation, that that is suitable. You know, that is not being immodest because when you go to a fancy dress party, people are expected to dress fancy. You know, that's, that's, that's like, that's, that's, that's why they're there. Or say for a protest, you know, a protest today, like we, you, you are trying to make a sign or people might dress differently because they are trying to draw attention because that's the purpose of the protest is to draw people's attention. And that's why I think in that situation, it's not being immodest. And it's the same with costly array, right? Doing your clothing up. We already looked at you know, Ezekiel 16, a bride being adorned for a husband. Celebrations, uh, a wedding. You know, I don't think it's necessarily wrong for women to be wearing jewellery and doing up their hair on that day because that situation calls for it. And even in the Bible, we see God doing that. So immodest apparel, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a generalisation in the sense that that's how we should be characterised, but that doesn't mean that there aren't situations where these sort of things are suitable and are okay. So they're not sinful in and of themselves. So we have authority, we have the situation. Number three is the perception. The perception. Um, what do I mean by that? It's what, what you think people will perceive you to be. And that's something that should be considered. First uh, Thessalonians 
uh, 5 verse 22. Oh, no, give me there. It says here, abstain from all appearance of evil. Now, that's not to say that our standard is set by other people's standards, right? Because even Paul said, why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? So it's not that we are trying to live by everyone's conscience, because that would be impossible. Because if you were to live by Muhammad's conscience, you would be like the ladies we see in Lakemba today, right? Where they just covered their face and covered everything, and they're just this black tent, because, you know, by his standard, he needed that in order to not last after a girl. Right? So we're not saying that you live by other people's standards or their standards are necessarily enforced onto you, but it's something that you need to consider as a Christian. Are you even considering it? You know, we shouldn't have this viewpoint that I don't care what other people perceive me as. I don't care what other people think because the Bible is saying here that you don't want to appear, you, don't, you want to abstain from the appearance of evil. That's what other people see. So you need to at least consider it even though it's not necessarily the commandment that you need to, to live by. Um, Romans 14, uh, verse 13 says, Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. So it's not that how you dress should, how others think of how you dress is the basis of how, uh, what you think is, is right and wrong, but it should be taken into consideration. Yes, you know, if you wear this, are men going to lust after you? Yes, but even if you dressed more modestly, men still might lust after you, see? So it's, it's, it's not that you necessarily need to go by every man's lust, how you dress, but it needs to be considered. You know, have I even considered it? Do you know what I mean? Uh, do, do you even take it into consideration? And you might want to get the opinions of men around you that love you. You know, if you're wondering, how do I judge this? Because you like think, well, I think I'm dressed modestly, but you know, what, what, what might it be perceived as? Well, maybe ask, you know, ask your father, ask your brothers, you know, am I dressed immodestly? Do you think this, this draws too much attention to my body? Uh, or, or do you think uh, it's, it's okay? Get the opinions of men that love you, that will tell you the truth. You know, don't, don't, and don't do, you know, don't, don't like take a selfie, right, and, and post it on Facebook. You know, take a bathroom selfie, you know, like you're in this skimpy outfit. It's like, am I, am I, like, am I immodest? You know, and getting all the likes. So it's like, oh, everyone likes it, so I'm not being immodest. So don't do that, right? <laughs> don't post it on social media um, and, and, and obviously ask that way. Now, there is uh, the concept in the Bible of attaining wise counsel. It says here, a wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. So, whilst not everyone's counsel is right, right, because it's only wise counsel that lines up with the Bible, but there is a sense of wisdom in the sense people who have been in the uh, Christian life longer and have come across, you know, they've just lived life longer, may be a better judge of these principles when it requires a bit of a moral and conscious judgment and where you might want to ask people, you know, what do you think, what do you think of this? You know, it's not like you have to just tell anybody, but, uh, you know, like I said, you might ask your father, you might ask people that will tell you the truth. Uh, Proverbs 11, 14, where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. So they're not, counselors are not always right. You know, people, or everyone has their opinions. But is it at least being considered? That's what I'm getting at, you know? So it's not, the, it's not necessarily setting your standard, but do you even consider how you are perceived, how people might look at you? Are you causing a brother or a sister to stumble. It, this is not. This doesn't just apply to, to women, guys. You know, it's not just. It's not just women. You know, they dress immodestly, and they're the only ones that have to worry about it. Guys as well. Like you know, some of you guys work out, right? You know, if you work out and you're you're dressed in a way where it's showing off your muscles, that can cause women to stumble as well. So it works both ways. It's not just something for women. But like I said in the beginning, it's just something that men necessarily, we shouldn't necessarily be worried about because it's more an effeminate attribute. Um, number three, that, so that was perception. And, and this is the last one, so uh, I'm, I'm getting there. The last one is motive, right? So we had authority, situation, perception, and the, the three types of immodest clothing. The last one is motive. 
So what's the first and greatest commandment? Love God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength. The second is like unto it, to love your neighbour as yourself. That's your motive, right? That's your motive when you do anything. You know, when you live, you, whatever, whatsoever you, whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. So what is your motive when you dress yourself? Because that's what we're talking about in today's sermon. When you put on clothes, are your, is your motive, what does God think about this? Am I dressed in a way that's pleasing to God? Am I dressed in a way that won't cause a brother or sister to stumble? Am I dressed in a way that's setting a good example to my brothers and sisters? Am I dressed in a way that's setting a good example to the children of this church? You know, is this, this is how I want my daughter to dress? Is this how I want my son to dress? Because that's, that's other, the other children in this church, they're going to look at you as well, and you might be an example to them. And they might think, well, that's fine to dress that way because brother so-and-so in church dresses that way. So we are setting an example here in the way we present ourselves, in the way we talk, in the way we dress. So is that being considered? Is that the motive of your heart? Or is your attitude, you know, I don't care what anybody thinks. I don't care what, but is that being loving to your neighbor? Is that loving God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? So your motive is something that you can judge clear cut because if you know that you ought not wear clothes that draw attention to your body, that you know, you're flashing your, flashing your wealth or you know, drawing attention to themselves, you know your motive is, hey, if, if I put that on, I am trying to, I want people to look at me. I, I want people to know that I've got money. You know, you know yourself. So that, that is already, we know, if you know, if your motive is to break one of God's principles, one of God's commandments, then it's done. That's a sin. You shouldn't be wearing that. Um, and this is where, uh, you know, your motive comes into play. And a lot of people, if they are honest with themselves, you know, they talk about, oh, I didn't know it was modest or whatever. When they, when they are honest with themselves and they look down into their heart, they know that that's why they were wearing it. And if you know that, you can, you're the best judge. Right? You know what you're thinking and what, where your heart is at. Um, so our attitude should not be, I don't care. Our attitude obviously should not be, I know it's wrong, I'm going to do it anyway. Our attitude should be, I want to please God. I want to love God with all my heart, mind, soul and strength. And I want to love my neighbor as myself. I want to do the right thing to others and to others in my church and to others around me. So here are some questions. I'll just read through this list of questions um, that you can ask yourself to, to, to judge your motive, right? You know, is this, number one, is this the right thing to, get, to do? Am I putting God first? Am I doing my best? Am I considering the needs and shortcomings of others? Uh, will what I, what I do encourage another to do right or wrong? Will what I do cause another to stumble? Am I trying to make myself beautiful only by the outward appearance? You know, am I, drawing, am I drawing attention to myself? Am I trying to draw attention to myself? Is the purpose of my clothes to draw attention? Uh, are my clothes designed to draw attention to sensual parts of my body? Um, you might think, hey, is this a good reason to, to reveal my shame to another person? Um, one might be, would I like my daughter or my son to be dressed like this? That's something to think about. Would I, you know, that's often one thing I say to guys when they're dating girls. And they say, you know, would you want your daughter to be treated this way? You know, if, you, if your daughter goes out and dates a guy, would you want the guy doing to your daughter what you're doing to this girl? And that can be a judge of whether you are loving your neighbour as yourself, right? Are you doing unto others as you would have done unto you? Um, you know, do I look like a prostitute? You know, look at yourself in the mirror and you're like, I'm looking at a prostitute? Then obviously that's not the right thing to wear. And, you know, I want my son or daughter to be... Um, would my father or husband approve of this? You know, like some girls, they don't live in the same place as their father. They put on an outfit. Maybe they need to ask themselves, if my dad saw me wearing this, would he be happy? If my husband knew I was wearing this, would he be happy? That's one way you can judge your conscience or your motive. Um, you know, do, uh, are my clothes overly expensive? You're thinking about buying something, you're like, that's, that's a bit too much. That's your conscience judging that you're buying costly array. Um, you know, do my clothes give the impression of immoderation? Um, and I've got like, hair, your hairstyle, makeup. Um, is my nakedness covered or concealed enough when I look at myself in the mirror? You know, Matthew 23, um, yeah, Matthew 23, verse 25 where he talks about, he says, Why aren't you scribes and Pharisees hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup and platter, uh, and of the platter, but within, uh, 
clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of ex extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. And I just want to make the point on this first, because obviously the outward is a reflection of the inward. So this sermon is not about giving you rules and setting standards to say, this is how you should dress. I don't want to tell you how to dress, right? I don't want to say, like, you must wear this article of clothes, you must not wear that article of clothing, and just, you know, if you're waiting for somebody to just dictate to you how to dress, I don't want to be that, and God doesn't want to be that either. God's just giving you principles because the principles are there to change the inward, right? But the inward is a reflection of the outward. So we're not just trying to get you to change the outward, but if I can get you to reflect on the inward principles, the outward will change also. So the emphasis is not so much on the outward appearance, but the fact that the outward appearance can indicate your inward heart. And when I was thinking about this, and I'll just end on this point, when I was thinking about this with my wife, um, because people ask me about immodest clothes all the time and things like that, and, and what I think about how to judge it. And I was thinking about it, I was talking about it with my wife, and I was just thinking, like, oh man, like, why, why can't God just give us, why can't he just dictate? If God dictated it to us, then I wouldn't have to think about it. I would know, like, okay, I just wear a blue shirt and black pants because it's in the Bible, right? And it's like, I know it's right because it's there. Like, I don't have to think about it. You know, I was just thinking, why can't, why can't it just be easy like that, you know? Because it's so difficult to, like, try and teach people these principles and get them to think about how they judge it, get, their, get them to have the right frame of mind. And I was thinking, well, how do, how do I do it in my home? Because I think, you know, I don't dictate to Elizabeth what to wear. You know, I don't, I don't buy her clothes for her. I don't go through her wardrobe and say, you know, I don't like this one and, and throw it out and whatnot and, you know, and put clothes in her wardrobe and say, I want you to wear this. So I don't do that. But I think, well, what would I want? When I think of like Elizabeth's dress and even Sarah, when she grows up, she decides what to wear. I don't want to have to dictate my wife's wardrobe. But what I would like is that my wife thinks about my preferences, right? She thinks about how I feel, how, how she knows, she, you know, she has a relationship with me. She knows what I like, what I don't like, what I think is immodest and what I think is immodest. And I would love for her to, you know, choose an outfit and I don't have to dictate it to her, but when I see her dressed, I'm pleased with it. You know what I mean? It's because, because she knows what I like, what I don't like, and she's striving to dress in a way that, I, that I, uh, is pleasing to me. And it's almost like, I don't want to have to dictate it but when I see it, it's something I like kind of thing. It's like, hey, that's nice. And that's how I think we ought to think of God, right? It's like God doesn't want to dictate what you're going to wear and everything. But when God looks down at you and he sees what you're wearing, do you think he says, man, that's, you know, this is my daughter. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. It's like I, I like the way. It's like I don't have to say what colors, what cut, whatever. But when I see it, I like it, you know. And I feel like that's what I should strive for with God. You know, God's not going to tell me each and every detail, but when he looks at you, is he happy with how you look? Anyway, let's, let's end on that point. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for, for uh, the direction you give us, because you give us liberty, Lord. You know, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. You know, our liberty is not judged of other people's consciences. We, Lord, you, you give us the ability to, to decide what to wear because it's another chance to show you how much we love you, that we've considered the things that you like and what you don't like. And, and Lord, that's at the forefront of our mind, that we love you with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Thank you, Lord, for, for being a God um, that gives us this freedom to love you so that, uh, Lord, we, we, we experience true love and we understand true love when we apply it um, you know, to our neighbour. So thank you, Lord. I pray, Lord, that this, is ed this sermon was edifying, um, got us to just think about how we present ourselves as Christians, and Lord uh, gave uh, some good principles to help guide um, and sway our conscience. So Lord, we don't have, all, don't have all the answers, but pray, Lord, as we continue to build a relationship with you through your word, that, Lord, we would understand you better, understand what you love and what you hate, and Lord, when we do things in our lives, that we, we strive to do things for your glory. Thank you, Lord, um, for Jesus. Thank you that um, we have freedom in this country. And I pray, Lord, that um, you know, as Christians, we would be the ones first that would uh, open our mouths and, and make known not only the mystery of the gospel, but other things uh, and, and get the truth, be a beacon of truth in this society. We thank you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.